So welcome to the Life's Worth Living podcast. I'm your host, John Gossett, and uh, we're here tonight with a very special guest, but I want to give a big shout out to our sponsor. Our sponsor of this podcast is GTM Builders. They are Tooele County's premier home builder. And uh, as you can see, we're recording in their beautiful model home here in Overlake. So if you're in the market for a new home, reach out to GTM Builders, talk to them and see what they've got available. They are a great home builder, great people, and so I highly recommend them. Tonight's episode is brought to you by A. Warner Homes Real Estate. If you're in the market for uh, buying or selling a home, uh, reach out to A. Warner Homes Real Estate or give them a call at 801-867-5078. So I'm super excited. We've got a Tooele County original. We got uh, Chad Hymas with us tonight, and so I really appreciate you coming and Thanks. hanging out with me for an hour. Been here for about 20 years, but I'm not originally from here. Well, come on, we're going to okay. count it. Yeah, we got to count. 20 years, <laughs> 20 years, you can count 20 years. Tooele isn't as small as it used to be, so no, it's not like you move in and 30 years later no. they're saying, "Oh, you're the new move in." So it's true. Very, very fair to say. When we first moved out here, man, it was sparse, and now it's. You know, it's filling in quickly and uh, moving out towards our neck of the woods. We live out in the country. It's not country anymore. I mean, people are building and are moving in. Well, and I've I've told people we're the seventh fastest growing county in North America. It's probably fair to say. And second in Utah. So we're, it's a great place to live. Um, Beautiful place. I moved out about the same time you did. Did you? So I'm an original too. There you go. That's right. (laughs) But uh, I love it out here. Yeah. Shondell and I love this. We've raised our family out here. Always been our dream to, to have a farm. So... That's, uh, that's where we're at. Well, and you've got a uh, big ranch now. Yeah, we've, uh, we've just finished that off. So that's been good to have retreats. Of course, with COVID, that's changed things a little bit, but we're still able to do that. And then we have our virtual studio as well hooked up at the, at the lodge. So that's all, that's all new within the last, you're right, last three years. Yeah. And then really transformed over the last four months since COVID came down in February. So let's give a little plug out to the ranch. What's the name of it? Uh, Royal Creek Ranch is with an ES. They can look it up online or just Google it, and it'll pop right up. Royal Creek Ranch, as I drove by it the other day, it is beautiful. It's out in right. Rush Valley, Utah, so check go. it out online. you got a good website, Thanks. too. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, on this podcast, we talk a lot about mental health, suicide prevention, yeah. and things that we see kind of going on, going on in the world. That's right up my alley, man. That's and. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, and you do a lot of motivational speaking. You, I mean, you've got a tour bus. You're going all over the world doing things up until COVID. And, uh, you know, tell me tell me how that's been for you. Because you know, I, it, that's a great question. You're just touring around the, the world, sharing a message, right? So my, yeah. I uh, never thought that I'd be doing that. I always thought that I'd be be farming. Um, I, uh, I broke my neck on the farm back uh, when we moved out here. So I came out here to build a dream from Salt Lake Valley, moved out to the Twilla Valley to build a dream and uh, broke my neck six months into that process and uh, became what you see today. So what you see today for, uh, for those that aren't, that are listening and not watching, um, I don't have, uh, my hands are curled. Um, I don't have uh, very good strength in my arms. I lost most of my arms. I am numb from the armpits to the toes. So my two out of my three chest muscles are gone. The only chest muscle that I have is the diaphragm, which allows me to breathe without a trach or a battery. Um, I lost all my stomach muscles. The midsection is gone. My legs are gone and my feet are gone. All 10 fingers are gone. You can, you can see that. And so they're, they're curled. Yet I am able to still travel, um, and I travel... Uh, I travel alone. It took a long time to get to that point, but I, I say that not to brag, but but I take a lot of pride in, in independent, uh, being independent. Um, I also take a lot of pride in uh, when I say independent. That doesn't mean that I do it by myself. That means that I that I I find friends, kind of like you helped me get in the house tonight. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and there was another guy that came and helped out as well. It's amazing how. Things are always put in place for me to get from point A to point B because the truth is I can't walk up the steps to get into this model home. And the door to the bathroom, I just went to the bathroom right before we started. You and I both know that that is not a handicap accessible bathroom, which is yeah. fine. This is not supposed to be. I, I'm cool with that. But it didn't prevent me from getting into that bathroom. I had a gentleman that was willing to fix the hinges on the door and I got to that bathroom, no problem. And, and we were, we're good to go. That's happened to me for the last 20 years in 89 countries on all seven pieces of ground that God made. And that's the, it's unreal to me. So, so I went from farming animals and alfalfa uh-huh. to people. And it's been, and when I say farming people, they, they more or less farm me. They've kind of helped mold me into this. Um, into the person that I am today. Not a perfect person by any means, but, but molded my thought process, my mindset, uh, 
you know, the depression that has sunk in from time to time and that still likes to visit once in a while. Suicidal thoughts that occurred mostly in the beginning, but, but they still like to come back and haunt me once in a while. Uh, you know, I just know what to do when they, when they happen. And so, yeah, uh, yeah we can talk about that tonight for sure. But, but no, that's, that's kind of the background is well, you going know, to I, farm. So. I was, <laughs> when I made the phone call to your, uh, your manager, and talk to her, and I says, hey, uh, is it easier if I come to him or, or easier if he comes to me? And she goes, oh, he's got this. Don't worry about it. He'll come to uh-huh. you. And, and, and I, I just think that says a lot about you because you've done some amazing things since the accident. I, I remember watching you on the news, and you were riding a bike from, did you start in mm-hmm. Tooele County? Started at the Salt Lake <clears throat> Temple. Started at the Salt Lake Temple and downtown and rode to Vegas? To the Mirage in Vegas. Yeah, that was dumb. I don't know that we're going to talk about that tonight. I, <laughs> I, I'd like to keep the, the keep keep the podcast upbeat, but yeah, that was probably one of the more stupid things that I had uh, set out to do. But I do I did want to break that record. Um, there's a cool story, you know, behind that too. Um, nobody had ever done that prior to me and pushed that level, uh, pushed that distance with my level of circumstance. And so, um, long story short, I trained here at the high school for 18 months, Twill High School indoors and out on the track with that bike just pushing left and right down the hallways kids would you know shout out hooray and, and give me pats on the back and almost knock me out of my chair I mean they would duct tape weights I mean coach Brady was there and he duct tape weights to my hands and my wrists and and the football players were great and just helped me get to help me get stronger but but something about that marathon that, that very few people know about is um when I pushed off you know when I pushed off from Temple Square at four in the morning on July 11th, 2003, there was probably four or 5,000 people there to, to send me off. And ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox were all there with their cameras right in my grill. And it was, it was, it was a good feeling. I felt good. And I think a lot of people feel that way when we have accomplished something or when, when people are around us, then they keep us upbeat. Um, or when we're around people that are going through something similar as us. We always find when somebody has lost a spouse, they find a group that they can talk to, a network, right? When, when, when people want to build their business, they find a network where they can you know, see how big the vision is and not be limited by their own mindset. We tend to network and, and socialize with people that, that are like mine or, the, or, or the, that have a, a, a bigger vision or a bigger mindset. And that's how I felt when I pushed off. People were there and they believed in me that I could do it. But day two, three, and four, those numbers decreased. And there comes those lonely times. And there was a time that I was by myself out in Miller County, and I wondered if I would ever get through. In fact, symbolically and metaphorically, I did give up on the race. I mean, I, I did quit, just like some want to do with life. I mean, I, I'm getting kind of right to the point tonight. Forgive me, John, but, but a lot of people like to give up on life. And I, just like I gave up on that race. I mean, just like Forrest Gump stopped running. Mm-hmm. He just said, okay, I think I'm done now. And Forrest stopped, stopped right there, just stopped. Said, I, I think I'll go home now. And he was running from the Atlantic to the Pacific and north and south to the borders. I mean, he, I love the movie Forrest Gump. It's very inspiring for me to watch. And then he just said, okay, I think I'm done now. And some people say that, okay, I think I'm done now. And I said that on day number eight. I was in Mesquite. There was 87 miles left to go. And I said to my dad, I think I'm done now. My hands were bloodied. I, uh, I was tired of being alone. My, granted, I had people around me that loved me, but, but, but it just, you know, when you're out there pushing in that heat and there's nobody else around you and my dad's on a motorcycle and I just, I'd, I'd also fallen, so I, I was also physically not doing well. Um, I, even though I couldn't feel the pain, I, they had stitched up my back and so I was on medication for that and, and uh, antibiotics. And I just told my dad, I said, I, I, I think that, I think that we're, I'm done. And he, he came out and he, he stopped his bike and he picked me up and he carried me into the motorhome there behind, behind the wheelchair, and set me in the seat of the motorhome and put a rag on my head and he said, son, I'll, I'll let you go home. If that's what you want, I'll let you go home. But before you give up on this thing called life, this race that you're in, this journey, let me ask you something. He says, how, he says, how are you measuring your success? And I said, well, what do you mean, Dad? He said, how... How are you measuring your progress, you know, this, this journey you're on? And I want people to think about this life journey that we're all on, and how they're measuring their success, their progress. And I said to my father, I said, well, Dad, I'm measuring my success by counting the green mile markers. You know, that's, well, that's what I'm, he said, I know, I've been watching you close. You are measuring your success by those mile markers and they're a long ways apart, they're a mile apart. 
and they're coming slower and slower because you're slowing down a little bit, which is to be expected. Likewise, I think people measure their progress by comparison to other people, by how much money they make, whether their house looks as nice as the neighbors next to theirs, whether or not they, they dress as nice, or whether or not the mole on their face or the cancer they have, or whatever they're going, the divorce that's now public that everybody knows about people. People are measuring their success by others' perceptions, which is a killer. It's deadly, very deadly. And I was measuring mine no different than them. I'll be judged no differently than those people there. People measure their success by, you know, some of the pain they've gone through. And they cover it up with a Band-Aid that could be illegal drugs. That could be something that's not prescribed. It could be something that is prescribed. And they over and abuse that. Um, I'm not judging that. I know exactly what that feels like. My dad said, stop measuring your success by something that's so, so far out. He says, measure it incrementally, just by the little things you do every single day. I said, what do you mean? He said, I want you to go out and push again, if you're willing. Chance number two. We all got nine lives. This will go to number two for you. We'll go to number two. And I'd like you to count the yellow stripes. And I thought that was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard in my life. He wanted me to count the yellow stripes. So instead of this, you know, every four hours measuring my success, now it's, that's really coming by every almost every three or four seconds. Passing another stripe. Okay, there's the next stripe. I got to hit that stripe. Okay, there's the next stripe. And that night, I pushed just over 2,300 stripes. And day number nine, I hit 6,800 stripes. And the last day, I hit 11,000 stripes, and we hit Apex Junction. For those that are listening that don't know where Apex Junction is, it's 17 miles north of Vegas, and it's all downhill from there. So we waited until 9 o'clock a.m. They shut down the strip for me. Helicopter in the air, 11 highway patrolmen on motorcycles, and I coasted my way to the Mirage. And remember what I said about that first day, all those people? Yeah. There were people running out because it was all over the TV channels and stuff inside the casinos at 10 o'clock in the morning or 10.30. Uh, granted, all of them were drunk, but I didn't care about that. Yeah. Drunk or not, I didn't care. They were there for They you. were there for me. Right? Yeah. They're my friends. And they came out and they were cheering me on and raising their glasses and toasting and, and like, like they were part of it. And they were part of it. They were a huge part because they made me believe in, again, something that I didn't believe in myself. And when I crossed that finish line, I remember what my dad said was true when he said, while the difficult takes time, the impossible in life just takes a little bit longer. Incrementalism, measure the stripes, count the little things that... Uh, that you're doing every day to make your life worth live, living worthwhile, your, your, your life worth living, which is the title of our podcast tonight. And uh, so I just, I, I find great power in that as I talk to people that are going through depression. I know exactly what that's like. Suicide, I know exactly what that feels like. There's two ends of that spectrum. There's pride, which is a killer. Mm-hmm. Too much pride is arrogance. Yeah. Too little pride is called depression. That's also a killer. Yeah. But right in the middle, right in the middle, and it's, it's, it's a hard place to stay at, but if we can find our balance somewhere in that middle line where we can have enough pride that's called confidence mm-hmm. and then not too much where we can be humble and grateful, that's where we want to be. That's the and sweet that, spot. That's the, that's the sweet spot is mm-hmm. the gratitude, the humility, yet still confident in yourself that, you can, that I can still be a husband even though I can't hold her hand. Mm-hmm. Shondell and I can't make a child. Um, uh, I can't teach my boys how to do a layup in basketball, but both my boys played varsity ball for Twilla High School. So I was able to, mindset is everything, yeah. you know, adapt and change and look at the little things that I could do in order to make progress, see them make progress, and still be married to the same girl today. Just celebrated over 26 years, but for, you know, for only six of those years, I was able bodied. For over 20, I'd been a quadriplegic. So I think that. You know, I think that that says something about Shondell and about how we're able to make that work by the power of mindset and making our life worth living. And she's an amazing lady, she's too. She's incredible. I've never met her. Yeah, Shondell's incredible. But everybody that I've ever talked to and she's come up in the conversation, everybody just raves about yeah, what an amazing lady. She's very, very soft, very, very humble. She's one that when my, when I, after I get out down on a stage, speak in front of a bunch of people and call home and say, Shondell, it feels good to be able to help these people. She, remember your calling. One person or 1,000, it really doesn't matter. God's not worried about statistics. She'll say those exact words to me. God's not worried about statistics. He's not going to say how many. 
God is not gonna God's not gonna say how many times did you try and kill yourself. He's not gonna ask me that. He is gonna want to know, hey, after you did make that bad choice, did you, did you try and do better? Mm-hmm. I will be asked that. Yeah. But God is not overly overwhelmed with math, yeah. with stats, and that has stuck with me since day one with Shondell trying to coach me and help me out. And whether you're speaking yeah. to twenty thousand or a, or, or a handful, as long as it's yeah. the right one. Yeah, you know? yeah. And we do that in the suicide support groups. I mean, there's there's days where we'll get mid thirties that'll show up to the hospital for the support group. Yeah. And there's times when there's not that many, but it doesn't matter as it doesn't, long as it it's matter. the person that needs it. Right. And that's that's something to remember. Yeah. And your dad sounds like an amazing guy too. Can um, you imagine the courage? Um, you know, I've got four children. Two of them are adopted. They were adopted after the accident. Mm-hmm. So there's a gap because we had the two boys prior. Yeah. And then my wife had this vision that our family was a complete yes. We adopted from Guatemala and from Ethiopia. Yeah. Um, so, so I can't imagine having one of my kids have an accident and losing all four limbs. I'm just saying, I, you, you have children. Yeah. You'd, you'd take their place in a heartbeat. Oh, yeah, for sure. I cannot believe the courage and the guts and the wherewithal that my dad had to come into that, 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 that you know, intensive care unit, the ICU, at University of Utah Hospital, and give me the news and then give me a call to action to be a better husband, farmer, father, coach, and disciple. He gave me that action. I thought it was a joke. And when he, when he heard my, my mumblings, my, my rumblings out of my trach and, and how I was disgruntled with what he was trying to say, because I felt like he had no credibility whatsoever to understand my position, he just turned around and walked out of the room. And I later found out why. He, he wasn't walking away because I was swearing, although I was swearing. Mm-hmm. He wasn't walking away because he didn't love me. That's not why he was leaving. He was walking away because I was being a horse that wouldn't drink. Mm-hmm. We say that on the ranch all the time. You can leave the horse to the trough. Can't make a drink. Can't make a drink. My dad came back, just like most dads would, and said, are you going to drink from the trough, or are you just going to sit there in that wheelchair like everybody else does? And that was the beginning of, of, of what was to come. Yeah. He did not want me to be like everybody else, and I certainly don't want people listening here to be like everybody else. God made them to be who they are, exactly who they are, so take pride in being that individual. I am 95% numb, and I should love this body because it's a, it's a gift, mm-hmm. and a gift that I won't have, you know, all the time, but one day I believe it'll be renewed to its full strength. I'm not going to sit around and wait for that to happen. My dad didn't want me to sit in a chair like everybody else. So I think that that takes a lot of guts. It does. It does. And that's, I can't even imagine having to deliver the news to anybody, oh, yeah. let alone your boy. Yeah. And so I what, agree. A, what an amazing guy. Yeah. So does he live locally? Yeah, he's about, so when I was injured, he moved from Salt Lake. He lives about 20 miles to the east of us in Cedar Fort. Okay. In the Cedar Fort area, yes. Nice. He quit his job and took over my dream of the ranch and has made it to what it is today. He runs all the elk and the hunting part of that. And then I run the lodge that's Royal Creek Ranches. That's oh. ours that we kind of run. So we kind of tag teamed up, but he's, he, he was an insurance salesman by trade. That's what he sold insurance, yeah. health insurance, life insurance. I mean, that's what he did. And he gave it all up. Wow. as soon as he got the news and wow. he took over the fencing and finishing that project off and I mean I just don't know that I would do that I mean I'd probably still do the same job I, I just that's where I get caught up in comparison I just I want to be like him because to me that's you know I, there's a there's a verse that I like that says something along these lines uh, greater love hath no man than he that, that, that lay it down his life for somebody else mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that you have to die for somebody no but are you willing to give up all you have to make somebody. somebody else better off. And that's exactly what he has done. And, my, I, I, and I want to be like that. I want to be like, I, I seriously strive to be like that. Even my, when I have depression and, or, you know, when those thoughts come to my mind that, hey, I, I know I said for better or worse. I know I said that. I didn't plan on her baiting me. I know that sounds like fun. It's not fun. Yeah. I didn't plan on Chandel getting me dressed. I know it sounds like fun. It ain't fun. And so... You know, that's when I let those thoughts come in my mind. And then I have to remember, you know, what, what my dad said, that gratitude piece and finding that, that strength to be grateful, authentically grateful and be the best version of me I can be. And then and our marriage is better when I do that, when I get upset or prideful or say, you know what, I'm done. 
Forrest Gump, I'm done. Mesquite, I'm done. Shondell, I'm done. It brings her down. It brings my kids down. Everybody's down, and it lasts for a while until I break out of it. And no drug fixes that for me. No drug. No drug. I, I'm just. I'm not against drugs. I'm just saying that for yeah, me, yeah. no drug has been a permanent fix. It's right here in my head, yeah. and I have to figure that out. And I'm gonna. It'll take me a lifetime to do it, but I'm getting better every day. It's been 20 years. So what, what's the best? Tri- I shouldn't say trick, but what's the best what's, thing? What's that, the, best, what's the yeah. best medicine? Yeah, yeah. What I'm doing now. It's people. Yeah. When I'm here with you, I don't have time to worry about what I've lost. Yeah. When Taking I'm out traveling in a hotel, uh, when I'm out traveling on an airplane, you know, my, my, my biggest struggle has been COVID yeah. because I've been stuck at home. But thank goodness I got a wife that gets me out. I've been, we've gone for walks and strolls and bike rides and horses and when I'm around people. So my drug of choice, that's why we decided to come here today. <laughs> it's just Leslie knows I need to, I want to get out. I want to go. Have that connection. Absolutely. That's my wife has allowed me to be on the road for the last 19 years, 27 days out of every month. Wow. Except for basketball season uh-huh. when the boys are playing. Then I'm home Tuesdays and Friday nights because I don't miss a game. But then I'll fly out. I don't care. The jet's waiting for me. We'll leave. The helicopter's waiting at the high school. I will leave um, because I've got clients I'm getting to. My wife understands. That's my. She's, that, I'm not saying that I'm right in that. I'm just saying mm-hmm. that that has been my medicine of choice. With COVID, yeah. it's, it's, it's taught me a whole new ballgame. I've had to learn, and I'm learning how to be grateful all over again consistently because I'm home every morning now. I'm not in a hotel room. Shondell doesn't want me to do it by myself. It takes too long. And she wants me to come hang out with the kids and have breakfast. That's a whole new... I mean, I know we've been married for 25, 26 years, but as stupid as it sounds, that's a whole new reality for me Yeah. This, these last three months. The last month has been... last month and a half has been pretty good. The first two and a half of COVID, oh my gosh. You want to talk about depressed and suicide. I mean, I... Those thoughts started surging again from clear back from 20 years ago. They don't leave permanently. And so, you know, I'm not immune from it. But I find my medicine in people and being with people and socializing with people, even virtually. FaceTime. Through Zoom. Zoom. Yeah. You know, uh, team, uh, Microsoft Teams. I mean, we, we've got all the studios lined up. So I just, I like to stay busy. Yeah. I like to stay busy. Take I don't want to be knocked off off absolutely on myself. About. Get the focus off myself. Get my focus on how can I, so instead of focusing on what I've lost, how can I best serve John? How can I best serve my kids? How can I best serve Shondell? How can I best go find someone that's in need? It doesn't mean I have to go pull weeds or mow lawns. I can't even do that. Yeah. But how can I find someone to serve, make a phone call, send off a text that lets somebody know that they have value in my life? Now we're talking about how I fill my days. That's how I fill my days. That's awesome. You know, right before I came here, I, I lived two doors away from my mother. She's 85. Okay. And she'd been kind of quiet this week, and so I, I uh, ran over there just to take a few minutes and check in on her, and, and she told me how down she's been with COVID. You know, kids aren't visiting, house is empty. She's she lives, alone. She lives alone. She's, she's a, alone. She's yeah. a widow, and, and uh, the last five years have been hard not having dad there, but you add all of this onto it where, you know, she can't even really leave the house yeah. for fear that she's going to get sick. or And, and you know, they, they're having that worldwide right now but in your business it's basically unemployment you know because you can't get out and do the speaking engagements which we've you transformed that i mean it's virtual so we built yeah, yeah. the studio but you're right i mean it's changed completely. the hospitality industry is empty yeah. hotels are empty there's nobody meeting in ballrooms people aren't gathering together that's there's no airplanes i mean they're parked right mm-hmm. so so it's it's completely transformed which takes us to the principle of adaptation yeah Right. Those that refuse to adapt, to change, which is an ever so ongoing occurrence in our lives. Those that refuse it will experience a great deal of pain in their life. Yeah. When I refuse to change with a changing pandemic, mm-hmm. a crisis, a paralysis, mm-hmm. you know, being at home more, when I refuse to be more grateful or find the positives in that, I will go through more pain. Yeah. It's just a law, just the way it a works. governing law. It's the way it works. It's a, just like the law of gravity. Yeah. It's a governing law. But when I'm willing to adapt and maybe say, you know, I could, I'll try that. I'll try and be more grateful. I'll try and say thank you a little bit more often and be real about it, not fake. Yeah. I'll try and, you know, maybe I'll try and, 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 you know, let you help me get dressed more. I, I'm sorry. I mean, I'll try and have breakfast with the kids. I, I don't really I kind of like to have breakfast by myself. You know, I'm used to room service at the yeah. hotel. But, you know, I'll, I'll try going and do some devotional in the morning. I'll, I'll try that. 
more has come to me in that process. Because you just never know what's there if you don't try. Yeah, for sure. You know, and, and it gave me a thought that, uh, you know, your deal with going all the way to Vegas on a bike. Um, there was, it was four years ago, and, and you might have seen it here in, in the county, and you might have been gone when it happened. But uh, I had this crazy idea that we'd do a suicide prevention walk, and we'd walk across Tooele County to Windover. 100-mile walk, and it's the long, longest walk in the nation for suicide prevention. And my wife looked at me, and she says, you're nuts. <laughs> to cross the desert. To no go across the salt flats. That's and the I'm salt going, flats, yeah. and, and, you know, there was, as you were telling your story about it, so these are kind of the thoughts that were coming through my head. It was, uh, it is nuts when you stop and you think about it. Well, what's walking 100 miles going to change? What's it going to do? But as we've watched that change each year, this year we had to skip it because of, of COVID, but we had four tour buses filled with people, 200 people that were going to walk 100 miles with me to Windover. And there's something about it that you had mentioned, uh, having the crowd waiting for you. If I were to walk to Windover by myself, I would make it to the Walmart distribution center. Yeah, in Grantsville. And I'd be like, okay, yeah, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> there's no way. But there's something beautiful about starting that walk. And, you know, you're not walking all of the 100 miles because you've got tour bus behind you. So if you get tired, you can get back in, but you can get back out. And and you're walking with people that you've never met before. But these are all people that have had like a similar journey and you're hearing their stories. And as you're listening to people and having that that human connection, those miles pass like the yellow the yellow lines, not like the mile markers, because you're focusing on somebody and their story and hearing, you know, what they've gone through and what they're doing. And it's, it's interesting because most people think of the salt flats and they think, boy, that's ugly. That's got to be one of the ugliest walks. Why didn't you, I had my son say, why don't, why don't you walk somewhere prettier than Windover? But you get out on that salt flat and you begin and there's something maybe it's the heat maybe it's dehydration but there's something in your mind that recognizes beauty where you wouldn't have ever thought of it yeah. and whether it's you know a little flower coming up in the middle of pavement or or the salt that is a, a opposite of a landscape we're used to seeing in utah usually we're used to seeing snow in the mountains and no snow on the valley floor at times right and as you're walking across the salt flats it looks like snow on the valley floor and none in the mountains. It's kind of a, a mirror image. And there's something beautiful about it. But what one person would try to do and probably wouldn't be possible becomes possible when you have that many people with you. There's something powerful about somebody that believes in you. Yeah. There's also something powerful about the, the principle of trust. Mm-hmm. When you're talking and walking along, so credibility is what I call it. With yeah. Somebody else that has gone through or that you trust and you're walking along to the salt flats that you're sharing stories back and forth that you can relate to because of their credibility. Yeah. How do you lose that credibility? You lose trust. It's like writing a bad check. Mm-hmm. For example, if you go have one of your grandkids or go to one of your children at home, you start playing catch with them. And I'm not talking about a baseball and a mitt. Mm-hmm. Just throw them up in the air and catch them, you know. Yeah. Drop that child one time. Yeah, it's over. It's over. <laughs> Watch how enthusiastic do the next time, right? <laughs> your, your, your pets are quicker to forgive you than your kids. Yeah. So what, I, what, I am, what I'm saying here as I listen to you talk is when you, when you have that opportunity to be by somebody's side and to be a mentor or to instill, uh, come from a place of credibility. You don't have to fake it. You don't have to lie. You don't have to create some story. Come from a place of honesty. And once you've earned that trust, do all you can to maintain it. Losing trust is devastating in relationships between moms and dads and children today. Uh, in marriages, trust is king. It's everything. Uh, uh, me trusting my dad that everything's going to be okay. Me trusting my wife that all will be well during COVID. Me trusting our leaders, um, church leaders, that, that, that all will be well. Me trusting my God, <laughs> my creator, um, in my meditation moments. You know, it's that trust. And I don't, I, I, live, I base everything on that trust factor, on that credibility factor. Once that trust is lost, it's very, very hard. Um, to get back. So I would encourage people that are out there that have gone through depression and suicide to use that as a, as a foundation uh, to build credibility, build your checking account, and go find someone else to help. 
you'll learn that yours isn't such a big deal. That's the power of walking to went over. Yeah. It's not such, you know, my, boy, my challenge isn't such, boy, I can help other people because now I got, I can relate to this. I can relate. Use that experience that you've had in your life of wanting to slit your wrist or overdosing on drugs or alcohol or, you know, illegal drugs, whatever that might be for you. Use that as a, as a foundation, as a tool, as a building block to help somebody else out. Yeah, totally Watch what agree. happens to their lives. They'll, they'll do incredible things. Well, you know, and that's the one thing I think when you said, you know, the human connection, taking the focus off yourself, you get out and, and you do a walk like that. And you might think that you've got it worse than everybody, but there's something about that. You get in a group that big and, and you wonder how some of those people have made it through and yet they have, and they're there to lift other people up and you're going, wow, isn't yeah. that amazing? You know, that you don't have to be, it doesn't, not everything has to be perfect in your world to help lift somebody up. Right. For you sure. know what I mean? No, so I, I think that's, I think it's amazing. Totally agree. Well, so tell me, so you've had, what, 20, almost 20 years, huh? In a chair? Yes. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, a little more than that. Yep, a little more. What, what's been years. the most difficult thing? Oh, geez. I mean, it's hard to pick one. I, yeah. I, I think um, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is just, again, this, uh, and I want to say this with, with gratitude, but, but again, having Shondell, my wife, be my caretaker. Yeah. And Shondell's love language, her biggest thing in life is service. Mm-hmm. And if she feels if she can't serve in her own home, then, you know, serving outside the homes, even, even, uh, you know, a bigger challenge. She's been blessed with the ability to do what she loves the most in her home. And so I don't want to say I'm the guinea pig for that. I am the tool for that. Yeah. And, I, and I get to enable her to live that life. Remember we said about laying down your life for somebody else's benefit. Yeah. Well, if I want to do that and be like that, that verse that I love so much, maybe that's the challenge that I'm going through so that I can lay down what my wants, my desires are for somebody else's wants and their desires and serve them in that way. And so, you know, the past 19 years, it's been other people. I'm not really in love with them. It doesn't mean I don't yeah. like them. It's just I'm not married to them yeah. when it becomes my spouse. You know, so I've in the last couple months, just to, so I've, re, I've, la- I've relaxed, I've, I've, I've lapsed, I've, I've fallen down where 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 I've gotten angry or upset or depressed or sad or, you know, I just felt, man, I, 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 I want to stop. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm done. I'm done. I've had those thoughts and yeah. even said those things out loud. And now I'm being taught by my two boys. Hey, Dad, can we talk to you for a minute, Dad? Uh, and here it comes. And I know it's coming. And, and they sit down and they're just, they're two return missionaries. And they sit down. Dad, we just want you to know that we love you. We need to know that Mom loves you. We know that uh, you don't like her help, Dad. Uh, but Dad, this conversation is not about you, Dad. Dad, this conversation is about Mom, Dad. Dad, we, we, we really want her to be happy, Dad. And we know that you want her to be happy. Will you sacrifice for her, Dad? And I always say I would do anything for Shondell. And now there comes this, but I won't let her help me, right? There comes, mm-hmm. And I can't do that. Yeah. I can't do that. I, I've always said I will do anything. For, I would give both my kidneys for my wife. Mm-hmm. John Travolta's wife died. He would have given whatever he could to save her for breast cancer. Gu- guaranteed. He'd oh, have yeah. died. I mean, we, we, people will lay down their life. They will die for somebody else. And yet I won't let her get my pants on? Yeah. Where does that equate? Yeah. It doesn't, right? Dad, will you just say thank you, Dad, to her dad instead of, Dad, please don't go quiet. Dad, that, that hurts mom. Dad, Dad, when you do the silent treatment, Dad, it, uh, that, Dad it's worse than everything, Dad. And I got a 22-year-old and a 20-year-old teaching me this in the last couple of months. And I've been teaching this for 19 years. Isn't so, that amazing to have them to... Oh, it's unreal. And, and, and that, then they say, Dad, 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 we just want you to live what you teach. And I'm saying, don't use my stuff on me, boys. This is, this is just <laughs> stuff that I write about, that I blog about, that I podcast about. Don't expect me to live it. You know, I, I, that's, a, that's a whole different concept, you know. But you know that discussion you had about wanting to be like your dad... I guarantee you both your boys are thinking the same thing. Oh, yeah. You know, and they're, I, I, they're looking so. at what you've accomplished and what you've been able to do at, where a lot of people would have given up. Yeah. And, and I think that says a lot about the way you raised your boys. 
that they can be yeah. there and, and know when to pick you up. I think that the boys, you know, and Gracie and Caleb who are adopted, they, uh-huh. you know, they're growing up in a home where the dad is paralyzed and the mother does most of all the physical labor, <laughs> whether that's mowing the lawn, feeding the horses, moving water, mechanic, and, and it, we can go on and on and on, fixing fence, uh, broken PVC pipe in the sprinkling system, changing on a valve, wrenching. I mean, I, we go on and cooking diapers. Of course, I never did a diaper when I was able-bodied. I just wouldn't touch that. Uh, but but Shondell has done literally everything. And for them to grow up in that kind of a home and then to know that, you know, you know, dad and mom are sitting by each other at all of our games, they don't miss. Um, you know, that they're truly loved. Dad and mom are they're going to church together. Dad's holding their hand even though we can't feel it. They'd seen that. Mm-hmm. those moments that helps them to be more open-minded towards everybody else and to not judge or pre-assume anything about anybody yeah. my boys and my daughter are not allowed to do that and they know that no matter what the color of their skin their gender preference gay non-gay i don't care yeah. you're not allowed even right now with all the political storm that's going on right now with people blaming others and all the nasty stuff you see coming from our top leaders all the way down to your school kid friends um, you are not allowed to act in that manner I need you to be the best version of you and to be empathetic and to have sympathy and love and kindness and courage. It does take guts yeah. to hold back those tweets because you're going to be critiqued. Everybody's got a critic mm-hmm. and you will have yours in your life. You're going to have the, we call them bullies. Mm-hmm. You're going to have bullies. Are you going to have the capacity to stay quiet in those moments? There are times when you stand up for yourself. There are times when you, when you let it pass, you let it go. Well, this year, 2020, I get, I think has kind of thrown us about everything that it could. Yeah. Uh, That's a great time to restart. I mean, we're talking, this is the middle of July. This is the mid midpoint of the year. It's a great rebirth with beautiful summer. Things is when things are growing or the desert, they don't, but, but what a, you know, what a, what a, it is a rough time to be, to be on the earth when, when things aren't as we have ever had in the past, they're not normal, but don't ask yourself what the new normal is or wait for it to come back. I would just say, what, what's the new next? Yeah. What's going to be the new next? And then just jump at it, jump in for it. And, you know, I look back and I think I, I had grandparents that grew up in the great recession or the uh, great depression, great depression. And, uh, you know, you look at them and they'd tell you stories and you'd be like, wow, how did you get through it? You know, how did, I can't believe you had to live through that, you know, and they were stronger and better people for coming out of that, you know, living through it and experiencing it. And 2020s might be a little bit different, but it still gives that same opportunity that, you know, someday we'll be telling this story to somebody else and they're going to be going, wow, you know, and, sure. and I think it's going to shape all of us worldwide. Yeah, we're, and we will, we'll come out better for it. We will, um, for sure. I believe all of humanity will do that. Um, I think right now we're, um, we are, we are being taught some two principles that we need to be taught. And um, again, I don't think that God necessarily curses individuals or causes people to die for any certain reason. Um, I I don't know the answer to everything, but I do believe that as an entire world, uh, humanity, that we are, we're having a gut check right now on what some of the most important things are. We're losing more people to hunger than we are to the disease itself because of the disease. And we are told to help the poor. Not to, not, to, not to kill them off by taking from the poor. And you see it all over our county, as great as Tula is. You see it all over our state. You see it all over the United States and all over the country as I've traveled, where we have just feasted upon those that are less fortunate. And again, I'm not saying that we need to go and solve all the world's hunger, but just one small act of kindness can really change the entire world. Yeah. And uh, I would challenge our listeners to find what that one small act of kindness is. I don't care if it's baking a cake. I don't care if it's the text saying to your children, hey, this is dad. I know I don't text very often. Sorry. I just wanted you to know that I'm sure proud of the young man or young woman you've become. You need to know that. And the next time that child is faced with fear, rejection, uncertainty, or doubt, the ammunition they used to fight that back with is dad's text. Yep. They know that dad's looking up to them. I, uh, that's one thing I can say I have done. You know, I, I've messed up a lot and I, and I failed a lot. I, I believe that those that fail faster is the key to success. And it's not those that fail. Those are failures. But those that fail faster. And I've done a lot of failing. The one thing that I think I've done right is to let my kids know the value they have, which gives them the confidence that they need 
to get a degree in college, to start their own business, to, to be able to get through an argument or a spat with their spouse, like my oldest son's married, and do it without having to call on moms or dads and to you know, work it out together as a team between your spouse rather than, you know, rather than, than, than call and blame and judge and, and you know, figure, figure it out, figure out yeah. how to work it through it. 100%. So, so talking about suicide prevention, and we've seen an uptick in wh- whether it be domestic violence and, and uh, overdose deaths. We've seen things just kind of spike with the COVID. Um, even prior to that, though, over the last decade or so, we've just seen this increase, and, and we have more people that are giving up. Than, They're stopping than ever before yeah. that are just stopping. And what do you think, what do you think the cause? I mean, what, what do you think's I don't think changed? Any, no. Well, one thing that's changed for sure is, 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 is this, this social media and we see what other people are dressed like, what they look like and we are, or people get addicted to pornography. So they have this expectation. So let's just start, let's, let's, let's come to pornography in a second, <laughs> but let's just, so with social media, people have access to anything, anytime, any just a click of a button, right? The swipe. Um, you, you, can you believe this? You can even pick and choose the right person for you to marry. All you need is an app, and you, have, and you can pick and choose the color and the, their height and the size, and you think that's the right one. Mm-hmm. I wrote a blog about this two weeks ago. You know, when I was in high school, I wrote a paper about the woman I wanted to marry. There was three criteria. The first one was that I wanted my wife to have the body of Cindy Crawford. That was my first thought. I wrote that. I'm embarrassed today. But that, no, I'm just being honest. Right? Being, we're being very, very truthful. We're about the same age, yeah, so I think we like, all have that same I wanted my wife to have the body of Cindy Crawford. Uh-huh. Number two, I wanted her to be respected by my family who held high values. My mother's Catholic. My dad is LDS. Mm-hmm. And so I grew up in a very high standardized home as far as, as, far as values were, were concerned. Number three, I would like to have my wife, and I wrote this in my paper, to be approved by the mother of Jesus, Mary. That was the, what's what, what I wrote. Now, when Chandal and I got married, I wondered if I married the right person. Not because she was doing anything wrong, but we, we had these little differences that started to pop up right after we were married. And I wondered if I, you know, I'm back to the paper, you know, this isn't going the right way. And, and then I break my neck, and then all these, these things happen. And I've come to find out that my paper was a little bit backwards, for sure. And that finding Mrs. Wright takes a lifetime. It's not done by an app and color coding and sizing up. And I want this age of a person, this color of hair and this. And so when you talk about suicide, it's because we're using this, this technology, mm-hmm. whether it's comparison, sizing people up and looking for perfection, comparing myself to somebody else that is maybe stronger than me or, you know, I even found myself in my chair and I've got a child now that's married that's going to have grandchildren. Mm-hmm. Comparing myself to the other grandparents and what I'm not going to be able to provide. You know, those other grandparents are going to be able to show them wrong. Nothing is, they're great people, don't get me wrong, but, but, but in my mind I'm thinking, yeah. I can't teach them how to rope. Yeah. And as soon as I share that out loud with my wife, then she says, there you go. You know what's right, though. You, you know, we've, we've talked about it. Yeah, I, I know. I, uh, sweetheart, she says, you just need to be yourself. Your kids are going to love your lap. Just like they're going to love roping with their other grandpas. You don't need to just be your self. Be the best version of you. I get caught up in it even today. Mm-hmm. And I've been teaching this for years. Yeah. I've been talking about it for years. So when you ask me what, what's taking people, social media has become more prevalent now in the last five years than it ever was before. And there's more out there, LinkedIn, Insta, Facebook. I mean, we go on and on. Uh, uh, what's the one where they can private chat and they can release it, they can erase it immediately? Snapchat. Uh, Snapchat, yeah. the stupidest thing. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I, I want to be careful. I'm just saying that, and once you say something, it's out there for everybody yeah. to see, even if you delete it. And people can screenshot that. I'm just saying that that in and of itself has caused people to compare, size up, um, and not be the best version of themselves because they have so many other people that are talking, talking about them. And if somebody doesn't like their, their, their post mm-hmm. or like the, their picture, they automatically assume that they're not like, so then they defriend them. Mm-hmm. And you see comments like this on social media. If you don't comment on this post, I'm going to delete you as my friend. Are you joking me? <laughs> if you don't comment on my post today, you're going to be deleted as my friend. 
think about the harshness, yeah. the stubbornness, the hard heartedness, the stiff neckedness that comes from that kind of a that kind of a mentality right there. And it kind I of gives you unrealistic expectations. They're totally unrealistic. And right? uh, and you read that the pornography, uh-huh. you start getting caught up in that. Unrealistic expectations. Unrealistic expectations mm-hmm. of what should happen between a man and a wife yep. and not the way that God intended it. And and listen, I love talking about this because I've had that taken away from me. I'm yeah. not saying that, that God took it away. I'm just saying that, sure. that, that, that I can no longer yeah. have that kind of relationship the way that I used to with my wife. Yeah. What's the message? Well, now you know why I hold it sacred. Mm-hmm. I talk about it a lot. Don't wait to lose something in your life like a spouse or a child before you hold them sacred. Yeah. Intimacy, sex. Mm-hmm. Don't wait to lose that somewhere along the way on your journey before you've held it sacred in your life. That should be held very, very sacred. And people today treat it like it's a game. Yeah. They give it away as a gift. They give it away for free. Mm-hmm. They, they flaunt it mm-hmm. for other people to see. They take, they take selfies in the bathroom of them half-dressed and think that that's going to make everybody have a greater perception of them. I see it in my own family, and I think it's, I think it's sad. Because yeah. if sure. they don't get somebody else commenting on it, or, if they, or maybe they don't even care, but just the fact they're posting that, Tells you that they have to do that in order to bolster themselves. Yeah. And nobody should have to do that. Well, you know, and I, I was talking about social media. When we were kids, when we were kids, you might compare yourself in your neighborhood. Or to the basketball star. Or, yeah. You or know, the football king, right? Or, but I'd look at that and I'd say, okay, well, I grew up in a neighborhood and we were all pretty much same financial situation. You know, we're all living in houses that are fairly similar or equal, you know, and, yeah. you know, you might have a buddy that had a boat, you might have a buddy that had some other toy or something, but, uh, you, you only have those people to compare to with social media. You have seven, billion. all of these friends, yeah. different financial, uh, ranges, and you might be sitting around going, gosh, our last family trip was to Lagoon and everybody else is going to Disney world. And mm. And so you're now comparing. Or they're comparing design. even clothing. Yeah. They're comparing. They're comparing, uh, uh, they're comparing others that they've never met that are the same age mm-hmm. and how pretty her eyes are, how yeah. long her hair is, and you know, you just. I, that's why the bottom. The, the, what, what's the answer? Be the best version you of be. you yeah. that you can be. Be the best version. The comparison is evil. It is deadly. It is a killer. It is. And when I find myself doing that, it brings down my family. It brings down. When I compare myself to others' abilities versus my own, it does nothing but damage yeah. my children and my, my, my spouse. It damages the office. It damages my productivity. I've never been happy, productive, or successful comparing myself to somebody else. Oh, I've done it. I just never found success in it. But when I've tried to find a place to serve, give, and love a little more, more has come to me in the process. And I'll end this segment or this piece by saying this. Before my accident, I was looking for a way to make money comparing my ranch to somebody else's ranch to build that thing and make it as pretty as possible. Since the accident, I've tried to find a way to serve a little bit more and I've still been able to make a living and build a dream in the process. That's it's, amazing. A, it, it's, it's nothing shy of a miracle. John, it's, 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 it's not possible. Yet, it, it's happened in my life. If that's not proof enough for me in my life, I don't know what else God can do to show it to me. No, I... I... I agree completely. So what would you say to somebody if somebody was sitting here with you today and they were struggling and they were thinking about stopping? What would, what would your advice be to them? Remember, I can't make them drink. Yeah. That's principle number one. So when I say to them, how are you doing? And they're going to start and they start with the word I mm-hmm. and I, I, I'm not very talented. I'm overweight. I'm 13 years old. I weigh 200 pounds. I'm ugly. I, my parents are divorced. I, I'll stop them right there and say, you know what the problem is with all your sentences? Start with I. They all involve them. The next time you open up your mouth, I'm going to ask you again. And I'm going to ask the same question. And I want you to use the words you, we, ours, and us. Then they're going to stop and think for a second. And they're going to have a hard time answering the question. And I'm going to say, okay, so tell me what's going on. They're like, well, we have these challenges. And... And they're going to stop me. I can't say I'm overweight. I can't. They're going to be thinking now. The more people stop using the words I, me, and my, the more that they focus on other people, and the greatest thing happens with that. 
they don't have time to worry about their own pain. They're always worried about somebody else's. And those are the those are the Nobel Peace Prize winners of the world. Those are the disciples of the world. Those are the God-fearing people. Those are the people that really stand out and make a difference. The people that are comparing themselves and taking their lives, they're damaging the lives of their people. They're damaging their own life. And you know what's really sad? They're not finding their purpose. I have found my purpose when I stop thinking about I, me, and my. And I think that's... And that's, that's, again, that's, now you know what my addiction is. Hmm. My addiction is people. Yeah. Hey, if I'm going to be addicted to something, that's not a bad gig. No. Right? (laughs) There's a lot worse things. Right, right. So that addiction's not a bad... I'm addicted to people. Yeah. People help me keep my mind off of myself, my kids, and they, but when I'm sitting there alone... I'm, you know, I, and I, and I find myself tempted with those thoughts, mm-hmm. you know, I've got to, I might, I might, I might play with them a little bit. I need to get out of it quick because yeah. the longer I play with those thoughts, the more likely I am to do something stupid, mm-hmm. get involved with the wrong friends, try a little bit of drugs here, you know, maybe show a little bit more skin here, maybe give it up. Right, it just leads to one thing. Maybe need to see the next worst film. You know, this one wasn't enough. I need to get something a little bit more, a little bit more drastic, and it's all free. It never does stop. Yeah. You know, I just you asked what what caused it. I don't. I don't think it's just social media. Look at the games that kids have access to, and it's yeah. you know how many people can we shoot up? How much blood can I create on that screen? And then from there, they have these little advertisements that come on. And say, hey, you want to talk to this girl? You know, chat with Veronica. I'm just. Yeah. That's that's where it happened. This social media thing. I'm not saying I, it's it's an awesome tool when used correctly. It's an awesome tool. Yeah. I think it's a heavenly God given tool, but when used incorrectly, oh my gosh. Yeah. People are just dying off the map. They're everywhere. I mean, just, just 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 like plucking plucking feathers or plucking a, a you know a, a dandelion. Mm-hmm. You know, they're just falling off the map. Well, it has changed so much over the years. You know, you look at the video games that uh, we had as teenagers. Frogger. Yeah, Fro- Frogger, yeah, Donkey Kong. Don- and, yeah, right. And, you know, you look at the, just hey. the graphicness yeah. of, of the new games. And, and have you ever gone back and looked at a, watched a movie that you thought was funny as a teenager? Yeah. You and can't. you go back and you watch it and you're like. <laughs> what was I thinking? Dumber, yeah. dumber. I thought about the same thing I watched the day. The grizzly, yeah, the grizzly bear one where uh, John Candy. Oh, I yeah, think, yeah. I, I thought, oh, my gosh, what was I thinking? I thought it was funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but one that, one, that, um, one that I absolutely love, and I could watch it over and over again. I just showed it to my kids. My wife thought I was wrong in showing it. Oh, what is it where he skips school and then... Ferris Bueller? Oh, <laughs> best movie ever. I lived that. Best movie ever. Minus the Ferrari. I yeah. lived that. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. You, you know, but you I just... I showed that to my kids and my wife said, that's a little bit... You know, it's got a little bit of language in it, Shondell. <laughs> This Ferris, this is this is okay. This one's okay. This one's better than James Bond. Shut down. This is either Ferris Bueller or 007. You tell me which one. Yeah. So yeah, oh, that was great, one of my favorites. That's a great movie. <laughs> I may have to go back and watch hey, that again. Oh, Bueller. Yeah. Oh, I just. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. And he's and he's depressed. Yeah. Cameron's depressed. Yeah. Right. Suicidal depression. Mm-hmm. I mean, he says it. Yeah. I think, I think I want to stop today. Yeah. But what gives his mind? He goes to the baseball game, and it's all it gets his mind off. He's around people. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, it's a great has nothing to do with suicide, and it's got everything to do with suicide. Isn't that amazing? How when you when you you look, you can find things that maybe you just as a teenager you probably didn't pick up on that. Oh yeah, you're right. You but know what you I mean? Look back and, yeah. But now you look at it, and you you see things differently. So I, yeah, it's it's really interesting. Now, have you ever stopped to think that the first time? And I think this goes for anyone. Have you ever stopped back or, or, or went back in time and thought, what if I had stopped the first time I had mm-hmm. thought about it? What you would have missed out on? For sure. I mean, it, it takes going through those valleys and the, and the rough times, I think, to really recognize the beauty and, and the things that, uh, and the things that we do enjoy and, and love and, and cherish. But without those, the rough times, you never value those good times. John, two things with that that you just said. The first thing is no one's ever climbed going downhill. The second thing is the fruit of everything good comes from that of change. The fruit of everything good that happens comes from that of going through adversity, of change. 
So instead of today when I have a, you know, my leg, right now my leg's bouncing, I don't like it, but I can either squawk about it on the podcast mm-hmm. or adapt and maybe move my leg out, which is what I've been doing today. <laughs> um, when, I, when you're willing to look at things from a different mindset, but look at it differently, again, more comes to you in that process. So remember, no one's ever climbed going downhill, and the fruit of all good comes from that, those adverse moments, the challenges that we face. They, they refine us. They mold us into who we become. They give us credibility in our checking account. They, they add money, if you will, to that account and gives, it gives us greater credibility to raise our kids better, to be better grandparents ourselves, to be better mentors, to be, to be better influencers to the people that we go to school with, to the people we work with, to the people that we associate with in our churches and our synagogues. Yeah, that's amazing. So tell me one, you know, to kind of wrap up tonight, tell me one story. If you had to tell, and it doesn't have to be about yourself, but something you've experienced, uh, what's the most inspiring story you've heard that kind of, it's one of those those feel-good stories that just makes you realize, you know what, I'm going to do this. Boy. There's so many. I, I think of America's Got Talent and the people that come on there that, you know, were so depressed and suicidal and they find their voice because an audience appreciates the voice they have. Or the blind guy that comes out and sings and plays the piano and he's never had that opportunity. People actually appreciate and, and give credibility to his ability to play the piano. I think of inspirational things that I've seen on America's Got Talent or Britain's Got Talent. I... Uh, I think of the tears that people shed when they see the audience, that they believe in them when they haven't believed in themselves. So I think about some of those stories. Um, one that might be personal to me is, is um, boy, uh, there, was, there was one today. Um, in fact, um, it, it involves COVID-19, and you see how many people are bickering back and forth about mask and no mask and if you think I'm going to make my kid wear masks to school you're 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 wrong I won't send my kids to school and and I don't know what's right or wrong I really don't care all I'm going to say is this it got personal for me today because a dear friend of mine who has a son that is 18 years old um she wrote a post I I think it's phenomenal I should share it with the group That'd be awesome. I, no, no, it's in, it's inspirational. So, would you help me? Yeah. Well, we got, so, just come over and grab my phone. Okay. And, and I'll show it to you. It's unreal. Her name is Carrie Lorenz, and she has. So, so this is what she wrote, and I thought it was spot on. I got it. You got it? Yeah. I'll pull it up right now. So it's right here, and I and I even I even wrote about it as well. But this is what she wrote. So. So again, remember, right now we're going through this thing called COVID and everybody has their own opinions and the news has got their opinions and CNN's got their opinion and who's to blame and Fox 13's got their opinion and you got people on each side of the fence, right? People blaming everybody and, and it's very, very confusing. Kerry writes this. Dear friends, let me, let me put it up here so I can, All right, here we go. Dear friends, For those of you that are thinking that COVID doesn't attack young people, here's a pic of our newly turned 18-year-old son in the ER today. So there's a picture right here of their 18-year-old son, and he's got tubes all over his body, and he's hooked up to a ventilator. 18-year-old kid, okay. And she goes on to say this. For those of you who think it's okay to lose a few people along the way, here's a picture of my newly turned 18-year-old son in the ER. Next paragraph. For those of you who still are still posting about your business being destroyed because of COVID, but then you post pics of you gathering together without masks, here's a pic of my newly turned 18-year-old son in the ER today. For those of you who think that this is a hoax or overblown, here's a pic of my newly turned 18-year-old son in the ER today. For those of you who want everything open back up immediately and send your kids back to school, but you still won't wear a mask yourself or give the example, here's a pic of my newly turned 18 year old son in the ER today. For those who think that a mask only makes 5% difference, so why bother? Here's a pic of my newly turned 18 year old son in the ER today. Dalton is the sweetest boy you will ever meet. We were hardcore locked down in our house for months. He has no Corona bites and no symptoms. He's fit, he's young, he's strong, and he has a chance of surviving this. Only in the last few weeks has he started to gather with a small group of friends and started doing summer 
lifting for football outside and in small pods of this high school football team. And yet here we are in the ER today. We don't know what the future holds, but I do know this. We are all depending on each other to make good decisions so that we can get to a healthier place as fast as we can. You can be there and be fiercely independent and still realize our interdependency one with another. That's not weak. It's not weak to be liberal or left or Republican or on the right. Or it's not a Marcus or whatever label you want to ascribe to it. It's being a good custodian of all this country has to offer and all humanity has to offer. It's honoring the value of your friends and humanity and other people, your neighbors, your community. Hard stop. This is not a lecture. It's me asking you to reconsider, rethink, or maybe even to take a pause. So the next time you have the opportunity to make a slight better decision than you maybe you've made before about wearing a mask or going outside or gathering people, maybe you might think about wearing a mask and doing something that might make a small difference for somebody else. Hopefully you'll, th- you'll think of our sweet son Dalton, because right now he's all I can think about. I cried when I read that and I never met Dalton. I know Carrie. I know the mother. Never met the kid, but there's a picture of him right here. And he's, he's all tubed up. I mean, you can see that. I mean, yeah. He's all tubed up. 18-year-old kid. Wow. And I'm just saying, I, I, I don't know whose fault it is. I really don't care. Yeah. But for me, I know now I need to wear a mask when, I'm, when I go to church. I mean, you and I talked about that when we came in here, distancing. Yeah. Masked up and what are we going to do to maintain our distance? And, yeah. And uh, out of respect for you. You know, and out of respect for but It's not about me and what I think I should do with my kids in my school. I, it's about everybody yeah. else. Remember that it's that I equation. We keep thinking I, me, and my. And boy, it's throwing us for a whirl. It's confusing everybody and it's making us blame and point fingers. I thought that was so eloquently written. That is. And so well done. Makes you stop and think. Oh my gosh. Makes you stop and think. Well, and if we would do that, and if we would do that as a country, if everybody would take that initiative, there'd be no problem opening up restaurants and, you know, bowling alleys and ballparks. And it'd be different for sure. Well, it's not the same right now, but at least we'd be out there at restaurants. Now they're reclosing them for a second, third time in some places. Yeah. You know, they had two or three waves. We have this, we have the, uh, you know, and I always thought it was me. I've got the attention span of a gnat. So, you know, you start with COVID and, and you get worn down so quickly that it's like, okay, I'm done. I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready to get back. But then, yeah, you, you see a story like that and it really. I don't know. It hits home. It, it resets you. Here's the thing, though. Remember, don't wait to lose something before you hold it sacred. This ought to be enough right here to all of our listeners and to share something like this with other people to to bring awareness and bring, again, I'm not saying who's wrong or who's right. I I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that we all are independent, interdependent with each other and that we all have a responsibility to take. And if just one person chooses to not abide by it, who does that affect? And that's not fair. No different than when I broke my neck. If just one person chose to not help lift that bale of half my body, who would have had to carry the rest of the weight? The other seven. Yeah. There was eight men there. If just one said, you know, I think I'm going to give up now. It's too heavy. It's too hard. You guys got this. The other seven have to carry that burden. No different than COVID. Just one person chooses to be abrupt, ignorant, arrogant. It affects everybody. And it, and it just spreads like wildfire. It just, it just spreads. It really goes back to that toll, be the best version of yourself. Right. Well, I, I seriously, I can't thank you enough for hanging out with me for an hour tonight. It's been fun. Thanks a lot. I, I really do appreciate it. I hope you know that. And, Thanks for having me. And uh, Carrie, our prayers are with your family. Um, that's a tough deal. Yeah. Tough 18 deal. 18 years old. Can you imagine? Yeah, years for old. sure. And, uh, you know, for those of you that have come back for another week, super, super grateful that you guys are, are willing to hang out with us once a week and do an hour with us. I know there's a lot of you that, uh, you know, this is being heard in 13 countries. Um, I can't believe that that it's gone that. I, we started it, we were thinking, okay, Utah here up in northern Utah, 13 countries. And I know there's people that may not know your whole backstory. Check him out, Chad Hymas. You're on, you've got a YouTube channel. Yes. How else do people find just you? Just my name. You just, if you just Google it, you can Google and there's, it's, there's a bunch of free videos, a whole bunch. There's the, the best, uh, the, the book is free. Uh, you just Google C H A D, Chad Hymas, H Y M A S. Um, we're on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and uh, we try and post positive and, and uplifting videos and, and do, do quite a bit of trying to do, do positive 
uh, affirmations every day. Yeah. So a lot of good information out there. And we're going to get out of this and you're going to get back to normal life. And, and so, yeah, check him out. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're taking bookings a ways out. Oh, us? Oh, yeah. we're, we're booked every day doing virtual stuff. And then I'm supposed to do my first live event in three weeks. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but we'll find out. So Keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. But, yeah, if you're interested in but having... the ranch is open, right? So we, did, we were having weddings and having leadership retreats out there where I'm doing, conducting that with 20 to 40 people at a time. And the lodge is big enough to handle that and kill, still maintain our distancing with masks and things like that. Nice. So, yeah, so we're, we're, we're moving forward. And it's, yeah. it's a beautiful spot, and that's Royal Creek Ranches. So check that out also. I think you've got a Facebook page. You've got yeah, the website. Yeah, website. That's our dream. That's, that's Shondell and I's dream right there. And so, you know... And and taking it back local in Tooele County, there are so many people that say, gosh, there's just nowhere out here to hold a wedding. They got a great place to hold a wedding Mm -hmm. and what a beautiful secluded spot. And, and, uh, you know, check it out because they've got a great venue. There's pictures on there. I think that show weddings being held. Yeah. We've had a bunch. We just had one last weekend. So check it out. Royal Creek Ranches. And uh, Google Chad Hymas, and if you're interested as a company, a corporation, having him come speak or, or maybe even coming out to his retreat, check it out and get in touch with him. Um, Chad, we're, we're lucky to have you here in Thanks town. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed tonight. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, you're local. A life for out here. I'll so. take it. I'll take it. <laughs> so I appreciate it. And if you're listening to this podcast and you're struggling and you're, you're hitting a point where you're having thoughts that scare you, and you're maybe hitting that Forrest Gump moment where you're thinking about being done, reach out and talk to somebody. Have that connection with somebody you trust. If you don't have that person in your life that you can trust, reach out to the Lifeline. Call 1-800-273-8255. They are there 24-7, 365 days a year, and they will be there for you. So reach out to the Lifeline. Again, I want to give a big shout out to GTM Builders for allowing us to record in their beautiful model home. If you're in the market for building a new home, that's something you want to uh, give a little bit of thought to, stop by one of their model homes here in the county or reach out to them at gtmbuilders.com. Tonight's episode has been brought to you by A. Warner Homes Real Estate. So interest rates are low. If you're thinking about buying or selling, reach out to A. Warner Homes or give them a call at 801-867-5078. Thanks a lot for being here. I don't know what brought you here, but I'm so grateful that you were here. Take care. We'll see you next week. Thanks.